You need to hear what the spirit of God is saying to the church. Amen. What, what, what is the Lord saying to the church in this hour? Okay. So, and he's speaking, he's speaking all the things that he has formally spoke, but he puts emphasis on certain things, right? And so there's an emphasis on people returning to the Lord right now. Souls getting saved. Uh, I had a pastor friend yesterday and his wife were up with their children and uh, I'm, we met them for coffee uh, and they're my, he's my age. We went to college together. They have Marcus and Melina. And so uh, we were talking about the emphasis on what God has now, even though all the other things are still there, the doctrines, uh, you know, first principles, the oracles of God, the doctrines of Christ, but there's things that are different moves how many understand there was a move of healing back in the early days then there came a move of the teaching on prosperity and all these moves are important there was a move of uh you know holiness it was actually called the holiness movement then there was a jesus movement and the problem is is many times people don't understand that it's a movement there was a there was a worship movement that went on you know uh probably from the time that uh I think I was in Bible Bible college till now where hill songs came out uh Jesus culture and you know no matter what anyone would say it was a worship movement in a sense it really was uh and so there's different movements now there's a movement I believe that God's starting a movement of awakening a real awakening and a coming back to Jesus amen just coming to him not coming to a doctrine but coming to the word right his doctrine not man's doctrine so uh i just want to read this to you and then we're going to get into uh what i want to talk about this morning um first thessalonians chapter two in verse 13 for this cause we thank god without ceasing because when you receive the word of god you heard it from us you didn't receive it as the word of man but as the word of truth amen the word of god which is affectionately at work in you that believe it produces results the word don't produce results in them that don't believe do you understand that how many understand that the word only works to the degree that you value it that you honor it and that you receive it as such right what does james say what does James say? Receive the word with meekness, right? What does that mean, receive it with meekness? Come on, you here this morning. Receive it with meekness, the engrafted word that, because if you don't receive it with honor and value, right? If you don't receive it as highly esteemed, greater than any other information or source that you can hear, then you won't be changed by it. You'll just go to church, and hear it but it'll never impact or affect your heart it'll affect your head right and you want the word to transform you on the inside bring a change and when there is a real change there's a shift in the way you think the way you speak the way you act that doesn't mean that you're 100 like jesus amen how many of you know that but you're going to see the fruits of the spirit begin to be in operation right Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, right? All those qualities that are of Jesus. You're going to see some, some of those fruits reflecting. And so those are important things. As I was talking to someone the other day, we were talk, they were saying like, oh, well, well we don't want to judge people. See, that's where, and as I was meditating this morning, lots of Christians are hung up on that. That's, that's actually wrong because the scripture tells you that there'll be times of judgment. But it says you'll know them by their fruit. So you have to assess appropriately. So you judge everything else in life. Don't you? you judge what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to go, where you're going to spend your time. You judge your gas tank when you go, gee, it's on empty. I better put some gas in it. You judge all kinds of stuff, right? You evaluate, right? You, you scrutinize in a sense. Why? Because you need to know where you're going to invest your time and your energies, right? You evaluate with people. Right. And a lot of times, you know, what people you can be around, what people are going to receive. How many understand what I'm saying? Who's going to receive or who are you going to, you know, be around? And, and it's important as you get older, you only have so much time. You only have so much energy. 
you only have so much resource. And I made that mistake early on the early days. You just investing too much. And some say, you can never invest in people too much. See, that's someone that's never invested. That's somebody that's never been around people. They've never been in a position where they've been investing, right? Paul can even tell you, you know? So uh, he doesn't want his labor to return vain, doesn't he? He wants some fruit, right? So he says, I wanted to read you the Amphite. Then you're gonna run over to First Peter and a couple other verses. Uh, where was I at? Do, do, do. First Thessalonians 2. I like to amplify it. It says, uh, we also especially thank God continually for this, that when you received the message of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. It's really good. Not as the word of mere men, but as it is truly is the word of God, which affects the exercising its superhuman power. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13, I like this in the Amplified, exercising its superhuman power in those who adhere, trust, and rely upon it. Superhuman. Now, how many of you would believe today that there's superhuman power on the inside of you? Amen. There's superhuman power. And in this hour, listen, I want to tell you, you need to live by superhuman power. If you're going to get through this, I'm not going to turn over because they tell you, even, even if so, the elect could be deceived in this hour. I, I personally believe that whether anyone agrees with me or not, I believe that uh, there is some uh, distortion. There's deception going on in the world right now. And, uh, you know, but if you're in the word, then you're not going to... Uh, I don't want to say victim because I don't like the word victim. <laughs> there ain't never really any victims, is there? You just kind of yield yourself to a certain thought, a certain mindset, a certain way. There ain't no real, vi there, there's victims when it comes to acts. But I mean, just saying in general, you know, because you choose, don't you, what to receive. You make a decision and a choice like Martha and Mary, right? Martha chose one thing. Mary chose the other. The scripture says, and Jesus honored it. Um, so, the Lord never said to uh, Martha when she was doing everything, and he never said, you know, Martha, you're a victim. <laughs> you're a victim of your circumstances. You got too much housework to do, too many guests, you know, too many responsibilities, right? Amen. Right? He just said Mary chose what was needful, which was hearing and valuing and honoring the word. And so don't you think that Jesus would find that pleasing today? Right. Doesn't mean someone says, well, I can't neglect all these things. It's like you don't have to neglect those things, but you do have to prioritize and value the word so that you can keep all other areas in proper balance. Right. So praise the Lord. I like that superhuman power. Amen. All right. Well, um, let's see where we're at. We've been talking about love. So go on over to first Peter. It's so quiet this morning. Praise the Lord. All right. We're going to go to Peter. Then I want you to go to Revelations and Revelations and Peter. Okay. And I've had this discussion with many people, even the uh, pastor yesterday, friend of mine, because, you know, when we're talking about the love of God, we need to see it in a greater picture in this hour. Uh, you know, I, I shared with uh, a gentleman yesterday, uh, a pastor friend of mine, I said, you know, I heard the Lord say to me during prayer on Wednesday night, it was a couple weeks ago, he quoted that verse to my ear like I heard a man speaking. And he said, multitudes, multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. The Lord is near, multitudes. And right away, you would think that that's the unsaved, the lost. You would think. But do you know Joel was not speaking to unbelievers? He was speaking to the, to the church at that time. And although it includes unbelievers, because God would have all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. How many of you know that? The reality is this. There's a lot of people in a valley decision right now. 
and, and there's small decisions, there's large decisions and everything in between. They're in the decision mode, but they need the right information to make the correct, accurate decision. How many know that? Amen. And it's true. A lot of people don't have the right information. Now, I, I, I was sharing this the other day with, with somebody and they said, oh, it was uh, my son's baseball coach. He told me a story, uh, how he set up his uh, website or whatever to give lessons. And in order to do it, he gave to, to, so people can see the quality. He said, the first lesson is free. And so some guy called up and said he wanted it. And then, uh, you know, and then he called back and said, oh, I, I chose somebody else. And he said, okay, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, it wasn't about the money because actually he's scholarship in Caleb right now. He's 50 bucks an hour. That's what he charges. That's a cut down price for someone in the neighborhood. He's scholarship in Caleb right now because I told him I can't give you 50 bucks an hour right now. I'm not working. He said, Caleb's on scholarship. Right like that. I was like, praise God. Thank you. Um, so to get so anyway, he told me what he said was he offered that for free to the guy. I said, Well, why don't you just come grab this free lesson? And then the uh, guy never responded, you know. Just grab this free lesson. Because it, it, you know, a person that has a, a quality and attribute in them is not looking just to make a dollar. How many of you understand what I'm saying? It's not their goal. Their goal is, is achievement. Their goal is to produce. And I said to him, I go, hey, how come you don't take pictures and, and show when you're, because, you know, he, he's, he's not a techie. So he's learning how to get his, but he's a great coach, man. No joke. Has a lot of kids and, and helps him. Caleb has massively improved working with this guy. And so I was like, you should document this and then put it all on your website. He's like, yeah, I should have did that four years ago with Caleb. And then they can see the improvement. I'm like, I know, no joke. But anyway, so we're talking and he kind of got all stirred up and he goes, man, he goes, cause I'm, cause I'm one of the best out here. And, and I, man, I was like, brother, I, he, he was like, oh, sorry about that, man. I was like, nah, don't apologize. I like that because the truth be told is I think as we're talking about accurate information, right. To make a quality decision, you need the right information. I'm thinking I'm giving the right information in this hour. Amen. I said, bro, if you don't like your own coaching, you shouldn't be in it. If you don't like your own preaching, you shouldn't even be a preacher. If you don't like the revelations you're spitting out, then and you don't feel confident, not that you're ever to compare with anybody, but if you don't like the revelation tumbling forth, that you feel that the information you're giving someone gives them enough to make an accurate decision, a great basis of faith, so that they can move out in the will of God confidently, not timidly, not shyly, but they can boldly jump out in the will of God. If you don't feel you're given correct revelation and you kind of peter and ponder and you have to do like a lot of massive studying just to give a revelation, you're not confident in the word you're given. Amen. And people can't grow from it. Right, because it came from here, right here, head knowledge, right? God said the natural man. So the reality is, is, uh, and I want to share this because I, I, I've been listening to it and uh, I shared it with a couple people this week about, I'm not saying it's accurate, but there's some truth in it in what's where we're at, the time we're at. And uh, a pastor shared with me about Revelations chapter six, about the white horse, and the first seal being opened, okay? Well, I asked that person. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna scrutinize your revelation. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna investigate. And because when it comes to teaching like I'm doing right now, this is standard teaching. But when it comes to end time prophecies, you need to be careful. Like that lady came to the door and said, Jesus is coming in 2021. She had the first part right, Jesus is coming. Absolutely. I said, you're right. Thank you. So I ate that, validated her, agreed with her. But then when she said 2021, I said, thank you. You have a wonderful night. Because in order for him to come in 221, all the things in the word of God would have to be fulfilled. According to his word. So that's going to take some time unless it all just happened in the next month or two. I mean, it could, it's possible in the next three months, you know, just things break out and just go, you know, and Jesus come back in 2000. I mean, that's possible, but there'd have to be a lot of stuff 
which couldn't have had, they'd have to build the temple and they'd have to do all this. Other, they'd have to get the red heifer. They'd have to get the right oils in there for the priest vestments and all these things that are precious things that need and take time. So uh, possible, but uh, the, re the reality is, is um, so my point I'm, I'm saying is though, but there is some truth to what this revelation is, is uh, it's interesting because I ne no one else was sharing this truth. So this friend of mine shared it and I asked him, I did some research and I found that what he said is as a writer comes in, listen to this, then we're going to get to the word. I'm just giving you a nugget because it all is going to tie in what, what we're talking about. It says, and, and a writer came in on a white horse and had a bow and was given to him a crown to go for it conquering. So what he said was that that bow <laughs> Rita knows what we're talking about was that bow was deception that that writer went out because there was the idea that he had a bow but there was no arrows where people assume there was arrows but the scripture never says there's arrows you understand he had a bow and a crown so what this person believed is that the first seal was open that the bow symbolized deception and the crown he said symbolizes look coronavirus coronavirus uh, corona means crown. So uh, he said that the coronavirus is a big deception. It's deceived the whole world and so forth. And people have been conquered by it. And he said that that is the first seal. He believes that. That's what he believes. So I'm not there to change him. I'm there to, I'm, I'm not there to go, ah, I don't believe all, like I have another friend that went, nah, I don't believe that. And that's fine. But me, I'm going to be very careful to listen to investigate because I don't want to get caught slipping in this time. I don't want to be like my friend, Pastor Marcus said yesterday when I was sharing with them, he goes, I shared some stuff. And the reality is, uh, I don't want to just reject everything, but I need to investigate. So I started plugging in. Has anybody, because I believe this, is there anybody in this since Jesus came till now, Certainly, God would have shared this truth with somebody else about the bow. Certainly, don't you think? It's not like now there are those times where God reveals a revelation to one man only. There, there are those times, like truthfully, but it's probably not going to, I mean, be in the area of like the Apostle Paul. He's the one that had the reality and revelation of in Christ. Even Peter said, read Second Peter, said, Paul has some things that are really challenging to understand, but later on he got the drift. Okay. And so God used him to write three quarters of the new Testament. So, uh, here's the reality. So I looked it up on my own as research. And there was one guy, one guy that said, listen, one guy that said, well, yeah, the bow. So I called the other guy back and I said, well, have you been in any Bible studies? where you've heard this idea that you're sharing with me. Um, did you ever hear anybody preach on this? Uh, um, how did you come to this understanding? You know, so I asked the questions before I told them I did some research. So he said, nope, I, I, I was just reading and, and it just it was there. I said, okay, cool, man. That's how, that's how it happens with me. I mean, I could show you this morning. I just opened up the word and there's a the word that co he's coming again. So every time I've been opening up the Bible, every time I go to the right place, and there it is, he's coming. Now, it's not a coincidence. I'll read it to you right now. I ain't even read that sec section, that chapter in a long time. And God will tell you, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. It can be five to 10, 20 years. I mean, I don't know. How many of you know, since the time of Adam, he prophesied, he said, her seed will bruise your head. Well, it took 2,000 years. Just read Matthew. It gives you the breakdown, 14 generations, okay, from the time till Jesus came. So if he says he's coming, he's coming. That's it. You need to say the Lord's coming. That's the message of the hour. Prepare yourself. He's coming. Don't be like the virgins that didn't have enough oil in their lamp. Huh? You don't wait till that last hour. Uh, and we heard that. So anyway, so something interesting last night, that person sent me an article of some other man came to that same conclusion recently just last week 
And actually, I'll send it to you guys. Oh, I haven't read through it, but I thought that's interesting. That another person who this guy didn't even know came to that same conclusion. Now, you know, you need to be like, uh, you know, what was that? What was that uh, TV show, CSI? Because when it comes to end time things, you need to be like CSI. Amen. Come on now. I don't care how many people's up in this church or sees this video. I'm telling you the truth right now. I'm telling you the truth. You need to be circumspect when it comes to end time and prophecies. And not just jump on any bandwagon. But I believe the Lord's coming. I believe there's some truth to that. I believe the bow is the truth about doubt. I believe that. You know. I believe that. Now as far as is that the exact coronavirus? I can't say that. But it seems there's something there. So only time will play out. I can also tell you this, that that same person told me about something in the book of Daniel. And it was about what he said. I can just tell you, he said this about Trump and Iran. He said this. And last week, Trump was on Rush Limbaugh and said some, you know, incriminating statements. And I thought, that's really interesting. So, but like I said, things are, things seem to be happening right now. And you and I are not to fear. Amen. Jesus said, when all these things take place, look up. Look up. Because your redemption draws nigh. You ain't supposed to be looking on the earth anyway. You're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Scripture says that uh, uh, that's in Hebrews. And then in Colossians 3, it says, if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your mind, set your affection, set your attention. Amen. Set your, you're not supposed to be looking at nobody. Right? You're not. You're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. You're not supposed to be looking at natural things. Someone says, well, how do I do that? It's simple. When you're pursuing the kingdom of God, you'll get the things done. There's a super human energy that's at work in you that facilitates and directs and guides and leads your life so that you ain't wasting time. How many of you understand what I mean? There is. It's the Holy Spirit guiding and counseling you. John. John always looks so good when he shaves his beard, I swear. <laughs> it's true. Okay. Can I get a witness? No. All right. So here, let's move on now. Go on over to first Peter and then revelations one, because we've been talking about the love of God, and, but I want to define the love of God because some people think that the love of God is just them being validated, them being endorsed. And then God, as I, as I wrote this down, this word came to me this morning. Uh, we need it. We're trying to catch the full view of God's love. Um, not just listen, his lavishment of external things. Okay. Now, we, when you say that, you need to be careful because people right away, their ears perk up and say, oh, you're against prosperity. You're against blessing. I ain't against prosperity or blessing at all. Amen. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and has no sorrow. So you got a whole lot of people that go, man, I ain't into prosperity. I know, but you're broke. You don't tithe. You don't give. And the church ain't built. You can't even feed the poor. So why are you not believing in prosperity? Okay, the Lord tells you it's a blessing of God. So he wants you to thrive. He wants you to prosper. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. The only problem is you don't want mammon having you. And a lot of people, because they're, I'll just say it like it is, because of where they're at in their stewardship, mammon controls them. But, but if you're serving Jesus, mammon don't control you. If you're serving Jesus, you say, yes, Lord, like King David. King David in First Chronicles 29 said, I'm just giving to you, Lord, what is yours? He never said, oh, here's just the tithe, Lord. The Lord said, hey, I need you to go make a withdrawal of like 10,000 and distribute it. Said, no problem, Lord. I'm just getting gave excessively to the house of God, right? That's King, that's King David. That's why he had a heart, even though he had some other issues in his life. A couple of times broke protocol and procedure, had Uriah killed, committed adultery, had some other issues going on in his life. But the Lord said he had a heart after God. He was quit inside, right? So God wants us to prosper. So we know that that's established. But 
for some others, I'm not saying in this church, but uh, I don't think so. But if I'm wrong, hey, receive the word. For others, I think they need to come back to, to the centrality of who Jesus really is. Amen? He's still lavishing, but I believe Jesus has said, now, here, let's take the focus off that. That's established in you already. You know, you don't keep laying a foundation. Now it's time to build on that foundation. Amen. And so for some people, they got to get back with this aspect. He doesn't want to just lavish external things upon our lives, but he's given us the endowment, the greatest gift, which is the Holy Spirit and all his attributes. Has any? The Holy Spirit and all his attributes. So for a believer, you and I, and, and we already know this, but it, it doesn't matter what we know. It's what you need to be reinforced in. God's given us all things that pertain to godliness and life. That excites me. I need to, I, 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 amen. I need to stay fervent. I want to be stimulated by the word in my spirit. I don't want to go and let these things slip in any area. But I feel there's an area right now, the Lord said, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12, be fervent. Amen. All right, let's go to Revelations real quick in 1 Peter. Oh, Revelations, here we go. I have to give this verse so I can just, you, you know, to reinforce what we're saying. We're going to Revelations. <clears throat> Revelations 1, 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful and trustworthy witness. Amen. Come on. Now I want to say this because I got out. Is Jesus a trustworthy witness? Help me out this morning. The quicker you say amen, the quicker I can get through this method. Jesus is a witness. What is Jesus witnessing to? I mean, what is he witnessing to? What's it? the love of God? I mean, when Jesus witnesses, what is Jesus? Come on, think. What is Jesus witnessing? A lot of people think, well, Jesus, what's he witnessing to? Love of God, but but in more defined terms, what Jesus is attesting to and witnessing to is what God did in his plan of redemption. That's it. That Jesus say, look at the cross, look at the blood. Because of that, you now have access to my father. That's what it says in John 14, 15, 16, 17. You now have an access. Oh, Lord, come on. Help me. This. Here you go. John, real quick, I just want to show you. Because here, I got a lot of Christians, and they're not really excited about life. They're waiting to get some money before they're happy. They're waiting to get a wife or a husband. They can't get stirred up about just Jesus. Jesus, right now on the earth. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, when you can move into that dimension, right, you'll be more effective. You'll see more money. You'll probably see that husband or wife show up. But God, I tell you, God's a father. He's sitting back going, hold on a second. If I send those resources to you now, they could probably destroy your life. Because I notice you haven't had a lot of time in prayer and in studying the word. If I send that mate to you now, maybe perhaps that mate is going to become your idol. Now, just keeping it real. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that ain't true. Stop. It is true. The Bible says that Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world. People go, just loving life. A lot of Christians, oh, I love my life. Oh, I love my life. Where does that say in the Bible, I love my life? Where did Jesus ever say that? He never said, I love my life. That was never his confession. He said, I come to lay my life down. So a Christian that really wants to impact his generation. Now you can say, man, I thank God for my life. Man, Lord, I'm, I'm immeasurably blessed. But when I say I'm blessed, am I blessed just because I got a house and a car? And, or am I blessed because of what he gave? That the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me and that I lack nothing. That I don't lack any wisdom. I don't have any. Everyone in here has the same Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit. But do you know, it's like what Brother Hagin said. It's not that this person was any more gifted. I'll just tell you this is what he said. It's just that some people have chosen to unwrap that gift. Some just kind of leave it there and watch it and wonder about it. 
Some are like they're excavating continually. And that comes through prayer. I'm not talking about 10 minutes of prayer either. I'm talking about people that spend time in prayer for like two, three hours. You know, and that, that, that's people go, oh, you every day for one hour. And that, that makes people feel bad. So we live in a whole society now. Oh, that's just works. Why do you dismiss everything? Jesus prayed all night long. Now, if you and I aren't praying two or three hours, it's not about feeling condemned. It's just about saying, okay, Lord, maybe I can get to that place someday. You know, help me to get to start with uh, 20 minutes. Help me to move into 30. I know when I started praying, I was telling someone the other day, it was five minutes a day in the morning. And then one time I started praying with the Holy Ghost. I got baptized, filled. Next thing you know, man, it was an hour every day, every morning, and moving into more. You know, that's that's what happened. You know, and and then sometimes now it, it's it's smaller amounts. But then there's days where it's greater. But I, but I can tell you, this is more than a couple of minutes. You know, if I want to have a relationship with with my wife here, I've got to have some time spent. There has to be some investment on both ends, doesn't there? And God's invested, but he's still willing to invest. Amen. And our investment time, we know, isn't just at church. Church is a small percentage of your walk with God, isn't it? You know, so uh, where were we at? Revelation. Oh, he's, oh, I told you to go to John. I'm getting there. I, I'm telling you, God's handing out some stakes right here this morning. I mean. John, here he goes. I want to see what, what show you what Jesus said. What Jesus said. John uh, 16. Look what Jesus said. I mean, I, I hope this excites you. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, verse 25. But the time comes. Now, this is before Jesus was crucified. When I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I sh I'll talk plainly to you of the Father. Come on now. Doesn't that excite you? <laughs> you can read that to a lot of Christians. They're just like, I'm ready for the revelation. It's like, hello, the doorbell already rung, friend. It's like, listen, he says that day come when I'm going to tell you about the Father. I'm going to tell you, but here's what he says. See, at that day, you shall ask in my name. I say not unto you, I'll pray the Father for you. Come on now. Are you getting that revelation? He says, no, no, I'm not going to pray for you. Because of what I'm doing now. I've made a way into the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and you believed I came out from the Father. He says, see, in that hour, I'm not going to be praying anymore for you, so to speak. You're going to have direct access to the Father. See, I can share this revelation all through churches and people just go, look, they go, amen. Hey, man, look, you know why? Because that thing ain't revelation. No, it ain't revelation. It's up here. See, when you know I got access to the Father. See, there, there's lavishment of God. But then when, you, when you've had access to the Father, this is what you know about the Father. He does things incrementally. See, a lot of people read the book of Acts and there were some big outstanding miracles. Bam, hit it once. You know, Jesus said, go get that fish and there's a coin there. Big catch. But I remember when I was first a Christian and I read an Old Testament where the Lord told the children, I'll drive them out little by little. A lot of Christians don't have faith for the little. Zechariah, I think, or said, despise not the day of small beginnings. They want God just to go, man, bam, overnight. They got a master's degree. They got a bank full of money. They got everything they want overnight. They're not willing to walk that. Because you know what happens when you walk that course with God over a period of time? You don't waver. 
when the corona comes, you don't have to shut your door. You don't have to draw back. See, we're preparing ourselves for that day. If that mark of the beast ever hit, what are you going to do? It's all fine to say right now. Oh, I would never take the mark of the beast. Uh-huh, you'll be the first Peter there is. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Peter, oh, I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'll be with you forever. As soon as they were at the fire, there's this guy, I never forget, he said, Peter warmed himself by the fire of the earth. They said, hey, weren't you with Jesus? No, -uh, I wasn't with Jesus. Who, Jesus, who? I don't know no Jesus. Remember that? And someone else said, yeah, you look like that. And Hell no, he said. I wasn't there. Brother started cursing. <laughs> Hell no, I wasn't there. Jesus, what are you talking about? I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. <laughs> he it said he started cursing. He started tapping back into that old man when that fear and phobia came and that life-preserving mentality rose up in him. All right, here we go. So Jesus said, this is a great thing. Jesus witnesses the firstborn from Revelations 5. I'm going to hurry up. Here you go. Revelations 1, 5, he's a witness. The firstborn from the dead, first to be brought back to life, the prince of the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who ever loves us, ever loves us, and has once and for all loosed and freed us from, his sin, from our sins by his own blood. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Everybody loves that. He ever loves me. Right? I remember when I read this, I thought, you know what that means? That's a perpetual love. That means no matter who loves you in the earth or who doesn't love you, or, or this job got lost, or that person left, or that friend bailed, or who, <laughs> you learn some that the Lord never leaves you or forsakes you. And a lot of people can say that, but it's something better to live out in your own life, that you can walk smack dab with your head held high, as Romans 5, 5 says. Now I'm able to hold my head up high, and I know all is well because the love of God is shed abroad in my heart. He ever loves me. I mean, you get challenging times in life. Man will say, it's all right, man. You know, you're just going through hard times, getting down. But you can actually inside hide that secret and say, mm -mm, nah, God he ever loves me. Like the other day, I was sitting on my couch and I was going through some challenges and I was like, you know, it was economic. The devil's been doing that. And I just said, oh, no, 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 no. Not going to happen, Satan. Right away, I know where to go. Matthew 6. Because as soon as you go with Matthew 6, you have to get your soul aligned with the truth. And the truth is, is what Jesus said, take no thought saying. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How am I going to pay my rent? Jesus said, you see, when you think like that and talk like that, you're like those unbelievers over there. For they chase that whole system. They chase it. This is what it said in Matthew 6. Matthew, Matthew 6 is for the big girls and the big boys. If, if, you, if you don't want to get rid of your fear, don't read Matthew 6. Because <laughs> Matthew 6 elevates you to his thinking. Matthew 6, don't take no thought for today. What am I going to do? Because you'll realize how much comes out of your mouth many times. So, amen. Now, here you go. Go on over to 1 Peter now. 1 Peter. And I'm just thinking about these end times that we're in. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. He ever loves us. But then he has that other part where he says, whom I love, I address. I chasten. I correct. I help recalibrate. I help them to come to a place. Why? Why? What, what's God's purpose of helping you to bear fruit? What's his purpose? He has a purpose. When people can see in our lives, not just our preaching, you know what I mean? It's like we can, we, how many of you know this? Right now, you should be building relationships with many people. Right. Like the other day I was sharing with a guy We sat out here for two hours and uh, I shared some. I've never shared with him that 
But because we've been building a relationship, I was able to share. And then we went into Revelations, and it, man, it was a beautiful night. And I feel closer to that man. You know? Uh, will he come to church? I don't know, but I know he's a believer. I know he is. He wouldn't have sat there for two hours, and he, was, he even said some stuff back. I know he's a man of faith. And I know his lifestyle. It's not full of pollution. So anyway, um, in First Peter, people see our lives, and then they're going to give ear to us. And guess who we're going to be able to tell them about in this time? Because what you need to do, he that wins souls is wise. Right now in our lives, it's all about in your life, your life, your every person's life here. It's all about you having an access to someone's life so you can help prepare them. To help prepare them to either meet Jesus or, or escape the pollution of this world. That's what it's all about what God's highlighting in this hour right now. Someone says, well, he's highlighting other stuff. Nope. What he's emphasizing. Okay. He's emphasizing truth. And truth has to be just communicated rightly. You can share with people eternity, heaven, and hell just by being true. How many of you understand? And you and I need to fish. That's what's important to the Father right now. Praise the Lord. So, First Peter, look at this, and I want to I want to show you. He's already prepared you for it, but this is something uh, you and I have to uh, respond to. First Peter, I'm going to read some different verses. Uh, chapter one, I like I like this verse in 22, in the Amplified. In the Amplified, see what you're not hearing here this morning is how to be successful. You know, in the earth, I can tell you, seek first the kingdom, you'll be successful. We don't have to give you four points on how to lose weight and be successful and do this and do that. You can just hear the word. And the word does everything it needs to do. See, it's not up to anybody that's ministering to make the adjustments in your heart. The word of God does it when you receive it. See, if you receive it, not as the word of man, but as it is the word of God. You're sitting here this morning and go, man, that's the word of the Lord. He's going to help make the adjustments. The power is going to be released in your life. Not only to change you, but then to offer change to others. So look at this, First Peter. He says this. Uh, verse 22, I'm going to read in. I better read it in uh, King James first, and then I'll read in the Amplified. He says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Unto unfeigned love of the brothers, see you love one another with with a uh, pure heart fervently, with a pure heart. Now, there's no more pure heart than to want to bring somebody else in. I'm telling you, there's no more pure heart than that. We can look right here. We can see what the Apostle Paul said about his life. He said. Uh, let me see if I can find that real quick. If, if, and if I, my life be offered as a sacrifice and service to your faith, I rejoice and glory in it. Amen. Now, how someone says, well, I don't know if I could be at that place today. Well, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can all move in that direction. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Uh, here you go. Uh, go to Philippians. Chapter two. And. Verse 13, I'm going to start there. For it's God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2, 13. Do all things without murmurings and disputings and complaining, that you would be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without uh, rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in this world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain. Amen. So there's Paul even saying, is it possible Paul could have ran in vain? That means what he invested in someone may not produce the results that Paul knows that should be coming forth. Amen. He says, I don't want to run in vain. Neither do I want to labor in vain. That means I don't want to invest my time, my love, my energy, my revelation and you just treat it like it's nothing. Like it's a piece of trash, hear it, throw it in a trash bin, and call it a day. 
and go on your merry way. Right? That's what they that's what they did in First Chronicles 13. And what happened? They slapped the ark in a cart, treated it like it was what? Come on now. Ordinary. Broke protocol procedure. Uzzah got killed. Then a house went up. Oh, oh, uh, uh, what's his name? OBD dumb. <laughs> went over to his house. Not only was his house blessed, but it said all he had. The Lord specified all he had. That meant that not only was he blessed in his life, but things he had started to pop like popcorn, being possessions, natural things. Why? Because he valued it and treated it with honor and respect. Treat it God's house. Amen? Treat it the Lord's things. So Paul says right here, he says, yes, and, and verse 17, if I'm be offered on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'll joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause, rejoice with me. I mean, that's a hardcore hit, brother. Really, let's just, how many people you find like that today? <laughs> that's somebody, as a leader, how many people you find, he says, if I'm sacrificed on the service of your faith, uh, you know, what did he say? Rejoice. Um, I'm glad, meaning I'm glad that I'm pouring out my life for you. I'm glad because I know that God's going to reward me. But then he tells them, now go ahead and rejoice with me. <laughs> I mean, that's some heavy hitting spirituality right there. Right? So now go back to First Peter. Here we go. We're cruising. First Peter, I'm going to read the Amplified. This is the one, I, because this is what I really like. First Peter chapter one, since your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit, of course, right? Because we're talking about the spirit led life, not the life of you out of your own flesh. You've purified your hearts, uh-oh, for the sincere affection of the brethren. See that you love one another with a what? Pure heart. You have been regenerated, born again. Say, I'm born again. Not from mortal origin, seed, sperm, but from the immortal. By the ever-living, lasting word of God. See, you and I have been regenerated on the inside. We got something on the inside that society doesn't have. They can't purchase it at a store, can they? It can't be uh, left by an inheritance from a relative, right? You can't find it on the street. You can't buy it at Target or Walmart. It can only come to you by way of faith in Jesus. Come on. It can only come to you by you're receiving what he offered. Amen. Now look at this. So this is his love, but look what he says. Sincere affection of brethren. Now jump over to verse, uh, let's see, uh, chapter two. In verse, uh, let's pick it up in, where are we at? Oh, no, 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 excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me. Verse 14, chapter one, verse 14, first Peter. I'm showing this prepared. Look what he says. This is the same love, isn't it? He says, live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourself to the evil desires that governed your former life. When you didn't know the requirements of the gospel, but as he that called you, be separate, be hagios, be holy in all conduct and manner of living. What he says is, remember that old lifestyle you had? Don't condition yourself anymore. This is the message of the hour, coming back to Jesus. Coming back to living for him. What is, what is the greatest level of holiness? Loving Jesus. See, you, if you're loving Jesus, you don't have to tell people, don't do this, don't do that. They're just not going to do it. The more you conform to him, the dead fruit falls off. The dead branches begin to wither away. Right? Right? But at the same time, we need to know that Jesus is a holy God. He ain't just your friend. <laughs> oh, I took Jesus. I just, he's just my friend. I do whatever I want. It doesn't work like that. How many understand? 
a matter of fact, we, we were talking about this the other day. Scripture says, you know, you can't just say, I'm going to go here and do this and buy and sell and trade. What is your life but a vapor? Amen. He says, don't, but, but instead say, if, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, amen. I was sharing, matter of fact, I, 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 I surprised you brought it as a testimony. I was like, I need to see that. Like, this is a blessing because even though uh, she was a big part of the process, the Lord worked. There's, there's my official UK card. It's like a credit card. Look at that stamp on back. Praise the Lord. The Lord told me. All for a small sum. Now, I can cross the border and release Operation Dynamo. And I'll be truthful. We will be able to release Operation Dynamo. Um, I was sharing with my pastor friends yesterday, and I was, I, really, I, was, I was had tears in my eyes. Because when you see, you know, what that nation did, I showed you. I was here Tuesday a couple weeks ago. The, the top great, 10 greatest preachers of the world that are recognized. Who are the top 10 greatest preachers? Well, the Apostle Paul was first. Outside of that was 900 UK Englishmen. They didn't even list any Americans. Can you imagine that? There's no Americans on that list. The top 10 greatest preachers, nine outside of Paul the Apostle, were all Englishmen. They all had revivals. They all had Bible schools. I took my mom to John Wesley's house. Him and his brother created Bible schools all around the world. I mean, these people would get on boats. They didn't have airplanes. I mean, they were seriously committed to the gospel. You know, uh, they reached many people, many English people. Actually, you do your research. They went into indigenous cultures. They went into the South Pacific Rim. Some of those missionaries that were from England were eaten alive. They were cannibalized over there in um, down near Fiji and uh, what's that other place? Um, huh? No, but down there near those uh, New Guinea, New Guinea, those places over there, they were cannibalized. Do, do your research, Google it. It's known known information. I mean, how many of you want to jump on a ship with your family, knowing? You know, uh, there's somebody there that's hungry and not hungry for Jesus. <laughs> and you're going there to preach and, I mean, this is serious. I'm not being gross. Google it. And so, man, the Lord told me, it's time, you got to get back to another nation. So the Lord makes the door. I was sitting there this morning just thanking God. I was like, praise God. God's able, isn't he? You know, go through and I was telling Sraj, I'm going to go through and through and out this earth in these times, wherever the Lord opens a door to share Jesus, bring transformation. Amen. Bring that change. What, what Peter said, not your former you. Go from a Saul to a Paul. Amen. So look right here now. He says, verse 14. Or, or excuse me. Now jump, jump on down to a. Uh, uh, first, first Peter chapter uh, four. I'm going to read this. This is calling you to a higher level, right here. How many of you remember? Uh, yeah, Jesus is saying, "Shut the door on the path." So, how many of you remember um, when John was on the Isle of Patmos, and the Lord said, "Come up hither." What What He meant was, come up to a higher place of vision. And what we're talking about here is what God is saying in this hour. Now, I want to tell you, I haven't heard too many people preach on this verse right here. I'm not like patting myself on my, I just haven't. And I look, I wait, I want to hear it. Let me hear it. If I can remember, like I was sharing with some, my friend, Pastor Marcus, the other day, I go, you know, part of the love of God is that you receive first Peter, second Peter, Revelations and the book of Jude. See, if you can't dive into those books, that means that the total vision of what God has for you is incomplete. 
is incomplete. Because God has for you and I, and we have to carry this message. You should share these same truths with other people. Go ask people, what'd your pastor preach on today? What'd they share? Is it relevant to this time, this season, this hour? Or is it just something that has to do with the kind of like general Christianity? Nothing wrong with general Christianity. You know what I mean? But is it pertinent and revelatory with this moment, this hour, and this season that we find ourselves in as the body of Christ and in America? Is it pertinent to this hour? Amen? So here you go. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. For since Christ has suffered in the flesh for us, what he says is arm yourselves with the same thought and purpose. What does that mean? He says patiently to suffer rather than fail to please God. For whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, is done with intentional sin. Now, I remember reading this early on, and what the Lord spoke to me is this. There's suffering in your life. See, lots of people believe that Jesus came just to give them a cakewalk. Suffering occurs, and, and, and then there's those groups of people that think, Suffering's from God. No, it's not from God. It just occurs because you live in a fallen world. And because you, you have a human body. And your body is selfish. Your body, your temple. Your temple's selfish. Your temple, your temple has attitudes. Your temple has other things, you know, expectations, demands, all these things. So uh, it, it has an appetite, so to speak, the Bible says, doesn't it? It says the carnal mind's enmity against God. So the reality is right here. He says, I I'd rather suffer these things or persecution that comes rather than fail to please God. So you got a lot of believers focused on a lot of other stuff. But God says, if you really want to go to a deeper level and please me and, and watch what he says, he says, they'll be done with intentional sin. I'm not talking about smoking, drinking, cussing, spitting, chewing. I'm not talking about that kind of, that, I mean, that's like the weakest manifestation. I'm talking about heart issues. I'm talking about mentalities and ways that people have things that are going on, on in the internal realm. He says, be done with it. So they stop pleasing themselves and the world and they please God so that they no longer spend the rest of their life. Look at this. The rest of their life, this natural life, by the human appetites and desire, but they live for what God wills. They live for what God wills. Now you go and start doing a survey. Say, do you live for what God wills? They say, everybody would always say, of course I do. So that means you like First Peter, Second Peter, Jude. You like Revelations. You like all these other things. Amen. You're not. You're not afraid if the Lord corrects you. You're not afraid if, if a man of God comes with the word and brings attention to an issue. See, we live, I'm telling you, in America right now, we live in a place where we've allowed, the church has allowed itself to become sensual, even around the world, too. Where they become more prone to the natural than they are the spirit. And it doesn't mean that you got to be all legalistic. That, that's not, see, people get real legalistic. You know what I mean? They fall into, they fall into places. Amen. Let's look now, go over to uh, 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Let me get in here because this is where I really wanted to look. I want to just share some things. See, it is about loving people. It's just loving people God's way. It's loving people God's way. And what is the supreme expression of love? What's the supreme expression of love? Tell, amen. Tell people the truth. Tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. 
But tell them, as Paul told Timothy, in meekness. Don't go up to somebody, even your friends or your family, and tell them, man, you're going to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. You ain't going to catch no fish like that. First Thessalonians. Let me read over here in First Thessalonians. I got to get in this thing. Where was it? I had it. This translation. First Thessalonians, verse 12. Amen. Put on the love of God in this hour. What I'm essentially saying is take the time to spend with him and realize what Jesus is emphasizing right now. Jesus is emphasizing you capturing some lives. First uh, Thessalonians. We're going to read. We're going to start in chapter three. Chapter three. First Thessalonians three in verse 12. It says, and the Lord make you to increase and excel and overflow and love one for another and for all people, just as, as we also do for you, so that he may strengthen and confirm and establish your heart, faultlessly pure, unblameable in holiness in the sight of the Lord. Here it is, at the coming of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? With all his saints. So, What's the Lord saying right here, folks? What we just mentioned this morning. He's saying preparing yourself. But see, it's not just the Lord's coming. It is repentance. But you know what it is? It's rendering your heart inside. It's preparing your internals for his coming. Amen. And I'll tell you this. I didn't get a chance to read it last week. But the Lord prompted me. He had, I, I for whatever sake of time. But the Lord said this. There's going to be people. Right now, and I'm telling you, here what this is, I'm going to read it to you. Here's people right now. They'll hear this message, and uh, let me see. I got to read it. Nevertheless, do not one fact, uh, excuse me, this is just stay, keep where you're at. Second Peter 3 says, uh, Understand and know in the last days there are going to be scoffers and mockers. People who go after their own desire. And then they say to you, where is the promise of his coming? For since the forefathers fell asleep, all things, they've continued the same. This is just part of life. They're saying that now. We're going to get through the election. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be okay. Uh, you know, this is... this. We've had this happen before, you know, Martin Luther King, Vietnam War, uh, you know, infectious diseases, all these things. They say these are things that just happen when you say the, prepare yourself, the coming of the Lord. They say this is what they say. And God put it in here because he knew they had mouths like that. It's right here. Second Peter three. And then he says, for they willfully overlook and forget the fact that the heavens came into existence long ago. You can read the rest of it. Verse eight says, nevertheless. Do not let this one fact escape you. But with the Lord, one day is a thousand years. The Lord does not delay and is not tardy, slow about his promise, according as some people's conception is slowness. He's long suffer, extraordinary patient towards. He doesn't want any to perish, but all should turn to repentance. Then you can read, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. He'll come like a thief. Then the heavens will vanish away and all the other stuff. Since you know this, See what kind of person you ought to be. Consecrate it, what your behavior, devote godly qualities while you wait earnestly and look and expect that day. Amen. Here you go. First Thessalonians now. Back there, we're going to close up with these couple of verses. He said in love, First Thessalonians 3, he said, establish your heart. Can I say that I'm established today? Uh, to some degree, but I never want to sit there and go, you know, I got it. I've been reading, you know, the Bible and the word for 28 years. and I don't really think about all that. What I endeavor to do is cultivate and grow daily. Amen. Try to reach people right now who are going to say, yeah, they're going to say just like second Peter said, like I just read to you. I've already had someone say that to me. I'm not kidding. They're going to say that. 
They're going to just kind of dismiss it away. They don't mean to. I know you didn't expect to live past 120. Your body's out the door, friend. Who you are, gone. You know, as you get older, you can only, you, you know, you can take care of yourself, exercise, eat right, you know. The reality is, uh, you know, here's the thing. I mean, your body's just a temple, man. Know who you are. Know who you are in Christ. Amen. And know those that labor amongst you. It's like I said many times on Friday. People don't even recognize, you know. They don't even recognize things. They didn't recognize Jesus, huh, did they? They're like. Jesus, that's just Jesus. That's just Mary's son. Mm, there you go. Here it is. First Thessalonians 3. It says, may the Lord give you richer love so that he causes that you to superabound in divine love. Self-sacrificial love one for another and toward all. May the Lord help you grow big for one another. Load you up so that you run over, one translation says. In closing, we look at this. Uh, let me find this one. Colossians 3, verse 12. You should know this. I'm not even going to go into the King James. Put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels, of, that's the King James, bowels. We don't, I heard one teaching by Rick Renner say this, though. You know, it says bowels of mercy. This is a good teaching that he has. You know your bowels? How many guys know what your bowels are? Look, your bowels are like, you know, they say, we're not being gross, but you go to the doctor. I saw a video the other day. Bowel movements. Some people, we was talking with the Siraj yesterday, like, some people have struggles in those areas, you know, where it's been like weeks we were talking about. But he said, that's why he said bowels. Bowels of mercy deep within you, the apostle Paul said. He didn't want just a superficial little, hello, hi, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord wants bowels. You know what bowels of mercy look like? Looks like the apostle Paul saying, and if I offer my life on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm going to rejoice. Even though you may not be grateful, I'm going to still be glad that I had the opportunity to pour out my life as a drink offering. Even though that person, I don't want to labor in vain. That's not my goal. That's not my desire. Because there's a lot of people that I've labored and put in their lives and poured out as a drink offering. And where are they at today? Who knows? But the reality is, is you poured out to them and God gone are you for that. Amen. So he says, here it is. Colossians 3.12, above all things, put on love. Now, I'm going to read you a couple of these, and we're closing. Here it is. The Weist translation says, oh, put on divine and self-sacrificial love, which is a binding factor of completeness. This is interesting. Here goes uh, Barclay. Crown to crown all. You must clothe yourself in love. Now, love ain't just like, I mean, we can look over at Brother Rich hugging his wife over here. That's a form of love. But ultimately, it's going to get down to love when he gets home. And she says, yo, run out that trash can. So we're all growing in different attributes and understandings. And you know what I mean? Or if, or if somebody in the church says, hey, man, we need you to. Clean the toilet or what? I don't know. You get my point? Love takes on many. That's why everything we've read, notice how it says self-sacrificing. Never said it was all about me. Everything we read in love had nothing to do with me. And I know a lot of people's flesh goes, well, what do I get? You got Jesus, friend, to set you free from the bondage of yourself, launch you into a place where you're actually happy like the appalled. Paul the Apostle said, hey, whether I got a lot of money in the bank or I ain't got nothing, I'm still happy. You can't take my joy, steal my joy. Doesn't matter. My joy in my life and my faith ain't based on what I got externally. And you think, well, how does that play itself out? I'll tell you, as you get older, you won't have to go to the hospital as much. Now, I'm telling you the truth. See, 
people think, well, all those people, they go to the hospital. You know why they go to the hospital? Because when they were young, they sowed resentment in their hearts. They sowed hatred. They sowed jealousy. They sowed inequity. And then later on, it manifests. People during this time, they don't have Jesus. So, of course, their mind's going to be on tilt. They're going to be on tilt because they're governed by fear. And fear does crazy things to you, doesn't it? So here it is. We just, but now I don't even trip off anymore. We, we just move forward. Here it says, most of all, let love guide your life. As important as a new piece of clothing, be sure to wear love because love is the evidence of maturity. Cap it all, love holds everything together. And you know what I've heard many times? You have to put this on yourself. When you miss it, you and I are going to miss it. I mean, there's nobody that executes love perfectly. But love never fails. The inverse of that is, is repentance. It's correcting yourself when you're out of love, right? And sometimes you get out of love with a bad attitude, a word out of your mouth, an action. But you and I, we just make the adjustment. And what God's calling us is to get back Focus on him and understand the Lord's coming. I'm not even going to give you the other verse. You'll have to catch it Tuesday. Amen. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.